Okay, so this um, lecture will actually be part two of the digestive lecture. So as you'll see, um, we ended on this slide, kind of abruptly on this slide, um, and I'll go ahead and pick that right back up. And mainly that the reason that I split this lecture was just because one, it's, it's a very long lecture, so it's hard to sit through all this information um, in one sitting, but also to, to hopefully um, make this, the file size a little bit smaller so that um, some of you won't get um, the, the hang-ups that you've gotten in the past in terms of um, some of the longer lectures. So hopefully this will kind of keep the lectures from getting so hung up on iTunes U. Okay, so we left off on this slide here and we were talking about the regulation of gastric secretion. And we talked about, again, the hormone gastrin um, actually increases the gastric secretions and the opposing hormone, cholecystokinin, decreases the gastric secretions. So, we also talked about, again, that parasympathetic, um, the parasympathetic nervous system stimulates the release of gastrin, and the sympathetic nervous system stimulates the release of cholecystokinin, or again, we abbreviate cholecystokinin as CCK. So, kind of along with this, it's interesting to know that are interesting to note that when a person actually tastes or smells or even sees some type of appetizing food um, or simply just when food enters the stomach, um, that's when the parasympathetic nervous system will uh, stimulate the release of gastrin. So what's interesting is if you just simply walk by a bakery and you know you smell all those smells um, coming out of the bakery, that that alone can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system to then stimulate the release of gastrin. And that will, that gastrin will then stimulate the releases of um, gastric secretions. And that's oftentimes why your stomach starts to rumble when you just simply smell food or you even just simply see food. You see some donuts sitting up on a countertop and again the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and causes the release of gastrin. Gastrin causes the release of gastric secretions in the stomach and all of a sudden your stomach's rumbling. So again it's kind of interesting to, to note that why um, you know, a person can just taste or smell or see food and then all of a sudden you know feel like they're hungry. So this is just showing you the um, parasympathetic, uh, <clears throat> basically the parasympathetic nervous system and how it innervates the stomach. So you can see the parasympathetic um, neurons directly innervate, again, um, the, the stomach, especially the lining of the stomach, the mucosal lining of the stomach, and they will stimulate, again, the release of gastric juices um, directly. And then... They also, that parasympathetic impulse, will also stimulate the release of gastrin. Gastrin will then be released into the bloodstream and then travel back through the bloodstream to the stomach um, where it will stimulate the release of even more gastric juices. So what's interesting here is in the slide we kind of give you a little bit more information in that um, we show you that the parasympathetic nervous system directly innervates the stomach inducing or stimulating it to release gastric juices as well as then it stimulates the release of gastrin into the bloodstream and then gastrin travels back to the stomach as a hormone and then stimulates even more release of gastric juice. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about uh, gastric absorption. The, the stomach is going to absorb only, and I say only because the stomach isn't, again, really a really for absorption. Um, it, it's a small part of what it, what it really does. The, 
main function of the stomach is for digestion and especially for protein digestion. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, but the stomach does absorb a few substances in small quantity, quantities. So it will absorb some small quantities of water. It will absorb um, a few salts. It will absorb alcohol, as you probably know, and um, some lipid-soluble drugs. And so this is why... Um, if you ever kind of have heard that, you know, some people say, oh, well, when I drink on an empty stomach, I seem to feel the effects much more quickly um, of the, the effects of the alcohol. And the reason is that if you don't have food in your stomach and you only have alcohol in your stomach, then more of that alcohol is exposed to the surface of the stomach. And so you'll actually absorb more alcohol in the stomach on an empty stomach than you would on a full stomach. So it is true that if you, again, drink alcohol in an empty stomach, that you actually absorb more of the alcohol. And the reason for that is that we actually absorb alcohol in the stomach. Again, um, you're not absorbing food in the stomach. You're just breaking food down in the stomach. Um, all the absorption of food is going to happen in the small intestines. But alcohol is actually absorbed or in small quantities absorbed across the stomach lining. Okay, so when we talk about um, some of the, the muscular actions that occur in the stomach, um, the stomach obviously is going to do a lot of mixing actions, so especially a lot of this, um, and we'll, we haven't gotten to some of these different motions yet, but um, one of the motions that we call segmentation, where it really is just churning and mixing up the food in with the digestive enzymes. So following a meal, mixing actions of the stomach are going to turn the food into what we call an acid chyme. And that's because basically here the stomach is mixing in that food bolus with the hydrochloric acid and um, the digestive enzymes, enzymes like pepsin and starting to break down those proteins. And this, that acidic, you know, chyme is what's left over after that. Now the rate at which um, the stomach empties is going to depend on the fluidity of the acid chyme. So again, um, how much, how how basically, um, how much liquid there is in that acid chyme, and also the type of food. So if you have a lot of protein in your food, for example. Um, then that, that food will remain in the stomach a little bit longer. And that's because the stomach, one of its main functions is to help break down protein. So if you have a lot of protein in, in the food bolus that has entered the stomach, then that food bolus will actually remain in the stomach for a much longer period of time so that all of the protein can be, as much of the protein as possible can be broken down. So um, also, obviously, if you have... Um, if you have more of a, more of a liquid uh, meal, then that's going to pass through the stomach more rapidly than if you have again um, a, a more solid meal in your stomach. And um, so again, those things will affect the rate at which the stomach is going to empty. And remember that again, once the stomach has kind of churned up that food bolus with all the hydrochloric acid and uh, the digestive enzymes, we now call it acid chyme. So at this point now, um, this is now called, no longer called a food bolus, but acid chyme. Okay. So now we're going to get into some of these accessory organs. And real quick, um, actually before I move on to the first accessory organ, we're going to talk about what happens here at um, the, the end of the stomach here. So as food again, um, as food then enters the duodenum from the stomach, um, what's going to happen here is the pyloric valve at the end of the stomach here will actually open and allow, again, some of that acid chyme to move into the duodenum. And so the duodenum, remember, is the very first portion of the small intestines. So when we talk about some of these accessory organs coming up, we're going to be talking about these accessory organs 
dumping digestive substances, digestive enzymes, especially into the duodenum. Okay, so, and that again, because we're kind of moving on from the stomach here. So now that acid chyme is moving into the small intestines, and now we're going to move forward through the small intestines here. So again, now our acid chyme is in the small intestines, especially the duodenum. And what you're going to find here is that um, the gallbladder, the liver, and the pancreas are all going to dump their um, digestive enzymes into the duodenum here. Okay, so again, in the very early portion of the small intestine is the duodenum. And what you can see here is uh, the because the pancreas and the gallbladder and the liver are all coming together here um, and dumping again their contents into the duodenum, there is a sphincter here that controls the release of those digestive enzymes into the duodenum. And this sphincter is called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Now the reason that it's called the hepatopancreatic sphincter is that it's going to be controlling um, digestive enzymes that are coming from hepatic the liver, okay, so that's what the word hepatic means. The word hepatic means liver, okay? And as you're going to find out, the liver is the main organ for producing bile. Um, gallbladder does actually, actually does not produce bile. It just stores the bile. So it's actually the liver that produces all the bile. And so that's why we call it the hepatopancreatic sphincter, again, because it's controlling the release of digestive enzymes that are ultimately made in the liver and the pancreas. Now, um, I'm just going to give you kind of a quick little overview of the anatomy here, and then I'll come back and review this in just a minute. But if you look here, um, the gallbladder um, will actually release its contents into the cystic duct that will then um, combine with the common hepatic ducts coming from the liver up here. Okay, So here we have the cystic duct from the gallbladder and the common hepatic ducts from the um, liver coming together to form what's called the common bile duct. And the common bile duct will then um, travel all the way down and carry its contents all the way down into the duodenum. Um, now here you'll see that the pancreas here is going to secrete its digestive en enzymes into this pancreatic duct. And the pancreatic duct will meet up with the common bile duct at the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So the hepatopancreatic sphincter is going to control the release of digestive enzymes from both the common bile duct and from the pancreatic duct. So just a little kind of uh, anatomy here for you to give you kind of an overview. Again, I'll go over this again in just a moment here. So the pancreas, if you remember, has an exocrine function. It also has an endocrine function. We talked about the endocrine function being that it releases insulin. But believe it or not, the pancreas has a much larger exocrine function. And remember what it means to be... Uh, an exocrine gland or have an exocrine function is that it actually secretes substances into a duct and then that duct carries the, that substance. In this case, it'll be digestive enzymes into whatever organ it's traveling to. In this case, it's the duodenum. So that's it. Remember, exocrine means um, substances are secreted into a duct. Endocrine means the substance um, i.e. hormone, will be secreted actually into the blood and then travel to its target tissue through the blood. So again, that's what endocrine versus exocrine means. Exocrine, again, you're secreting into a duct, and again, the duct will carry that substance to the target tissue. Endocrine means you're secreting um, a hormone into the blood, and then the blood will carry that substance all the way to its target tissue. So the pancreas is one of those unique organs that can do both functions. It has an exocrine function and an endocrine function. Now here we're going to focus on the exocrine function because that's associated, that's what's associated with digestion here. So the pancreas has an exocrine function of producing um, this substance called pancreatic juice that's full of digestive enzymes that aids in digestion. And really, um, we 
we oftentimes kind of don't give the pancreas enough credit or um, we, we really don't emphasize the importance of the pancreas in digestion. And it actually has a much larger exocrine function than it does endocrine function. Um, and both functions obviously are equally important, but... Um, but it has this huge exocrine function, and that is that it is going to produce this pancreatic juice that contains digestive enzymes that break down all four major macromolecules. So it's going to secrete digestive enzymes that break down carbohydrates, that break down proteins, that break down lipids, and that break down nucleic acids. So again, the pancreas is very, very important for chemical digestion. So when we look at the pancreas, um, the cells inside the pancreas that actually produce the pancreatic juice are called the acenar cells. And they make up the bulk of the pancreas. So the majority of the cells in the pancreas are these acenar cells that are dedicated to making pancreatic juice. Um, again, it's only a small portion of the pancreas um, that has the cells that are actually producing the insulin. So again, most of the cells are producing the pancreatic juice. Pancreatic juice, well, then as the cells produce that pancreatic juice, um, they'll secrete that pancreatic juice that into the pancreatic duct. So again, the pancreatic juice will drain into that major pancreatic duct. And the pancreatic duct, as we talk about, um, the pancreatic and the bile ducts join and empty into the small intestine at the same place. And um, that area is surrounded by what we call the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Okay, so this is just a diagram showing you what we talked about um, again. So here you can see um, the liver here um, will produce its bile and it will secrete it into the um, common hepatic duct. Okay, and then the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct from the gallbladder will come together to form the common bile duct. And then the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct um, will join and enter the duodenum at the same place. And here, where they enter the duodenum, um, is where we have the hepatopancreatic sphincter. Now, while I'm on this slide, I'm just going to kind of um, use this for a second to kind of take a little aside and talk about um, the production of bile, and then we'll come back and focus on the pancreas. Um, but what I want you to see in this slide is that, remember the liver um, up here, so the liver would be up here. The, the main function of the liver, well, I shouldn't say the main function, there's many functions, but the main digestive function of the liver is to produce bile. And when the liver produces bile, it will secrete that bile into the right and left hepatic ducts and then down into the common hepatic duct and then into the common bile duct. Now what will happen is um, if this hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed, as the liver produces the bile, uh, the bile will move down into the common bile duct and then eventually it will kind of back up here and if the liver continues to produce bile then what will happen is um, eventually that bile will then back up this common bile duct and then back up into the cystic duct and then fill the gallbladder. So that's actually how we fill the gallbladder with bile. And remember the main function of the gallbladder is just to store bile. So it just stores the extra bile there. So I just thought that was a good diagram to be able to show you that. Um, but we'll come back to the liver and the gallbladder in just a minute. We're going to focus again on the pancreas for a second. So pancreatic juice, what is this mystery pancreatic juice? So pancreatic juice contains, um, as I kind of hinted already, contains enzymes that are going to digest all four of your major macromolecules. So what that means, guys, is that pancreatic juice contains enzymes that are going to digest carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and nucleic acids. So some of these enzymes are going to be pancreatic amylase. And so as you can guess, pancreatic amylase is going to break down carbohydrates because if you remember, as I introduced before, when we talked about 
Salivary, salivary amylase. If you remember, salivary amylase breaks down starch. So here, same thing, pancreatic amylase is going to break down starch, um, which is a carbohydrate. It's just, again, an enzyme that's released from the pancreas, so we call it pancreatic amylase. As you can probably guess, pancreatic lipase is going to break down pro or I'm sorry, not proteins, break down fats. Okay, um, so again, or lipids. So you can think of pancreatic lipase as breaking down lipids. Okay. Lipids. So again, lipase lipids. And remember that ASE tells you that it's an enzyme. So oftentimes we will name the enzyme after what it breaks down. So that's the name lipase. It's breaking down lipids. And then trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase are going to break down your proteins. So trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase are all going to break down proteins. And then your two nucleases are going to break down your nucleic acids, especially DNA and RNA. So again, um, your amylase is breaking down carbohydrates. Your lipase is breaking down lipids or fats. And then trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase are breaking down proteins. And your nucleases are breaking down nucleic acids. So... Again, you know, pancreatic juice is very important in terms of um, continuing the chemical digestion, digestion process inside the duodenum. Now, again, regulation of pancreatic secretion. So the secretion from the pancreas is so important that obviously we have to have uh, mechanisms in place to regulate that secretion. So the nervous and endocrine systems are going to regulate the release of pancreatic juice. And um, in terms of the endocrine system, the main hormone involved with um, regulating the secretive pancreatic juices is a hormone called secretin. Um, and what happens is as the acidic chyme leaves the stomach and enters the duodenum, the uh, duodenal mucous membrane or the mucosa again of the duodenum um, in terms of the, the layers, right? So we talked about the mucosa layer being that inner layer. Um, the mucosa layer in the duodenum is going to release the secretin, the hormone. So again, it's the mucous membranes in the, the duodenum, in the small intestine that are going to release the secretin secretin into the bloodstream. Then secretin will travel through the bloodstream um, and then to eventually make its way to the pancreas where it will then stimulate the secretion of pancreatic juice from the pancreas. And again, this pancreatic juice we talked about obviously has um, all of these digestive enzymes, but it also has a very high concentration of bicarbonate ions. And remember, bicarbonate ions are going to neutralize acids. Bicarbonate ions are what we talked about as being your blood buffer. Um, so we did talk about that was how one of the ways how we how we basically transport carbon dioxide in the blood. It's actually the major way in which we're going to transport carbon dioxide in the blood is in the form of bicarbonate. And I told you the reason that it does this is because bicarbonate acts as this great buffer and it helps to neutralize acid. So we're also going to see bicarbonate secreted from the pancreas to help neutralize the acid of the uh, that acid kind because remember that in the stomach the stomach is secreting hydrochloric acid which is which has a pH of about two so now the small intestine just isn't equipped to handle that uh, acidic environment so what happens is the, the pancreas releases this bicarbonate to help neutralize the acid so that that acid chyme doesn't damage um, the lining, the mucosal lining of the small intestine. So again, remember that the pancreatic juices are not only going to have a bunch of digestive enzymes, but they're also going to contain bicarbonate, which is going to neutralize our acid. 
So again, this is just a diagram showing you um, this nice little feedback mechanism. So you can see again, as acid chyme enters the, the duodenum here, um, that's going to stimulate the release of secretin from the mucosal lining um, into the bloodstream. Secretin will then travel through the bloodstream and make its way to the pancreas, where there it will increase the secretion of your pancreatic juices um, that happen to be, again, very rich in bicarbonate ions. And so when that happens, um, they'll dump again, they'll secrete the pancreatic juice um, through the hepatopancreatic sphincter and into the duodenum. And that's where, again, um, the bicarbonate ions can help to neutralize the um, acid and that acid chyme. Now another hormone is going to be involved here and that hormone is one that I've already introduced to you. This is cholecystokinin, CCK. So cholecystokinin um, is also going to be secreted from the wall of the small intestine and it's going to stimulate the release of pancreatic juice um, with abundant digestive enzymes. So again, um, it's going to go back and stimulate the pancreas to secrete lots of digestive enzymes into its pancreatic juice. Now remember that cholecystokinin also at the same time decreases gastric secretions. And so again, this makes sense if you think about it intuitively, right? If if that acid chyme is leaving the stomach and entering the small intestine, then we no longer need gastric secretions, right? Because the food's leaving the stomach. So, um, and at the same time, it increases the secretion of, again, uh, pancreatic juices, especially pancreatic juices high in digestive enzymes. Okay. So um, that's the major role of the pancreas. Now we're going to talk about the major role of the liver and the gallbladder again, which are two other accessory organs. Mm. So um, the liver, again, is going to be this um, reddish-brown um, organ. In It's a very large organ. It's actually the body's largest um, internal organ. And you'll find it in the um, right upper quadrant of the abdomen. So again, um, if you look at the liver here, you're going to see that the liver is actually broken down into um, two lobes. You have the right lobe, which is a much larger lobe, and then the left lobe, um, which is the smaller lobe. Okay, so um, if you were to look at the, the structure of the liver, um, again, we talked about the liver is divided into right and left lobes, and it's um, enclosed by this nice fibrous capsule that helps to, again, hold it, hold it together. Each lobe, if you were to look into each lobe, um, each lobe is separated into these hepatic lobules. And these hepatic lobules are going to look like these big hexagonal structures. And your hepatic lobules are going to consist of um, a basically a central vein that will run through the, the center of this, you know, hexagon-shaped hepatic lobule. And then um, it will have cells, that hepatic cells, that are going to radiate out from that central vein. So here's kind of a, an up-close look at that. So here you can see, um, here would be your central vein, and here you can see these hepatic cells um, that are radiating out from that central vein. Now, remember that there, the liver has many functions. Again, one of its main functions is um, to basically um, help act as a blood filter. And so it will help to pull out old blood vessels that are um, you know, dead or damaged and filter out, again, any foreign agents that are in the blood. It also is going to produce bile. Okay, so um, you can see here you have the bile duct and the hepatic cells surrounding this will actually produce bile and secrete it into the bile duct. So again, um, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about some of these major functions of the liver here in just a minute. Okay, so um, now when you look at the liver, if you were to 
look at the posterior or back side of the liver, you would find the gallbladder here. And then here's the cystic duct. And remember that the function of the gallbladder is um, not to produce bile because it can't do that. The liver has to produce the bile. The gallbladder is just storing bile that was made by the liver. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the liver functions. So again, um, obviously we talked about it. It's one of its major functions is to produce um, the bile salts. So that's again the, the liver's major role in digestion is to secrete bile. And bile, we're going to talk about, um, is important for emulsifying or breaking down um, lipids into lipid droplets. So emulsifying lipids is the major function of bile. The liver is also responsible for many metabolic activities, um, such as the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Um, so again, the liver has um, some major metabolic functions. The liver also is going to store glycogen. Okay? Um, Glycogen, if you remember, is uh, our storage form for carbohydrates. And glycogen can be stored in the liver and in the muscle. So again, liver is just one of the places we store glycogen. And when you carbohydrate load, what you're doing is you're actually glycogen loading. So you're, again, um, basically giving your body what it needs to store more glycogen. Now, um, keep in mind that with carbohydrate loading, one of the important things that you do to carbohydrate load is you must train ahead of time. So, for example, if you're training for a half marathon okay, or a marathon, you need to run that higher mileage. And the reason that you need to train and run that higher mileage is that um, as you train more extensively, what you're going to do is you're going to train your body to hold on to more glycogen. So your body doesn't like to hold on to glycogen. Glycogen is a um, heavy form of energy storage and fat is a much more efficient way for us to um, store our energy. However, it takes us longer to break down fats than it does to break down glycogen. So if you need a faster form of energy, having more glycogen is the answer. And so what happens is as you're training, um, your body, especially if you're, if you're doing some extensive, you know, um, cardio training, what you're going to do is you're going to train your body to hold on to more glycogen because your body needs more glycogen and it needs that, that fast form of energy. So, um, again, carbohydrate loading the night before only works if you've done the training ahead of time. You can't be a couch potato up to the, you know, point, uh, the night before your race and then all of a sudden glycogen load or, or I'm sorry, carbohydrate load, um, because you're not, you haven't trained your body to hold on to that extra glycogen so but anyway that was a long story about glycogen but um, the liver is one of the places that you are going to store that glycogen so when you carbohydrate load again um, you're helping to build up your glycogen stores in the liver um, the liver also is going to store vitamins a d b12 iron and blood and so um, if you remember vitamin A is really important um, for vision and the reason being is that that vitamin A is required for the production of retinol um, so again and remember we talked about retinol and its function in vision back in the, the special senses lecture um, vitamin D is going, going to be very important for calcium absorption and um, vitamin D is so important that it's actually required for us to absorb calcium across the intestinal wall. So if we're going to absorb um, calcium, we need vitamin D. Vitamin B12, as you're going to see, um, has some major roles in the body, including, again, it's very important for um, the functioning, the normal functioning of the nervous system. It's also important for um, things like blood formation, and it's actually important for many other different reasons as well. So we'll talk about at the very end um, of the lecture why vitamin B12 is so important. 
And then, um, of course, we have iron, which is uh, going to be the major component of hemoglobin. And the liver also acts as the storage area for the blood. And the reason being is that the liver ends up being a filter for blood. So because it's filtering blood, it ends up having a lot of blood vessels in there, right, to help filter all that blood. And so it ends up holding a lot of blood in there as it's filtering the blood. So it actually acts as kind of a reservoir um, for our, our blood. And so that's how it functions as storage for blood. So obviously, again, as you guys probably know or, and are familiar with, that the liver is going to filter the blood. And it's going to filter the blood by removing, again, damaged red blood cells. It's going to remove foreign substances. It's going to remove um, toxins. And if you remember from the very beginning of the semester, we talked about um, the especially we talked about um, in the cell lecture, um, some of the different organelles and their functions. And we talked about the fact that um, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum um, it has a major function or role in breaking down toxins, especially alcohol and certain drugs. So one of the major functions of the liver is to break down toxins. And the reason that the liver can do this is that the liver cells have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum to help break down those tox toxins. So this kind of brings us back to the beginning of the semester. Again, that smooth ER is very important in the liver, and you'll find that your liver cells have a lot more smooth ER in them than um, other cells of the body do to help break down the extra toxins. Okay, now when we... Um, talk about bile, again, this is obviously the, the major digestive role of the liver is to produce bile. And bile is this kind of yellowish green liquid that the liver cells are going to secrete. And if you've ever seen a gallbladder, if you've ever looked at, um, you know, any type of cadaver, um, you've and you've seen the gallbladder, it looks like this, you know, kind of bright yellowish green organ. And that's because its main function is just storing bile. So it has, you know, it mostly consists of bile. So again, that, that might help you in terms of remembering that it's this kind of yellowish green liquid. And the bile is going to include water, bile salts, bile pigments, cholesterol, and electrolytes. Now, the bile pigments here um, that are included in the bile are going to include bilirubin and biliverdin. And bilirubin and biliverdin are actually breakdown products from breaking down the red blood, sp blood cells. Specifically, um, when you break down the hemoglobin in the red blood cells, then it breaks down eventually into bilirubin and biliverdin. So it's actually the hemoglobin in the red blood cells um, that's going to produce these bile pigments. And what's interesting is that these bile pigments can then further be broken down into a substance called stercobilin. And stercobilin, lo and behold, is this lovely waste product that makes your poop brown. I know, I know, you all are quite excited to know this. So really, you are poop looks brown okay, because um, it's just the stercobilin that's the result of breaking down the bile pigments, um, bilirubin and bilir or basically bilirubin and biliverdin, which are these bile pigments from the breakdown of red blood cells. So um, that is why your poop is brown. I know you were really, you know, wanting to know. That was a burning question for you. And some of you just couldn't sleep at night until you had the answer to that. And now you know. You have bile pigments to thank for that. And ultimately, again, those came from breaking down red blood cells. So then um, we also have um, bile salts. Okay, um, in our bile, and the bile salts are what are really responsible for emulsifying emulsifying fats or lipids. 
So they're really responsible for breaking down our lipids. And so that's why it's the bile salts that have the digestive function um, out of the bile. So again, when you look at bile, it's mainly the bile salts in bile that actually have the digestive function of emulsifying lipids. Now what's interesting is that again, um, we also see cholesterol in bile. And that, it's that cholesterol that can actually cause some problems for us, for some individuals. Because that cholesterol um, in the bile can, in some individuals, um, precipitate and form crystals that we call gallstones under certain conditions. And these gallstones um, can then end up in the bile duct and they can actually block bile flow into the small intestines. And usually when this happens, it causes considerable pain. So um, this is what we would call a gall attack. And oftentimes you see gall attacks will occur after an individual eats a really fatty meal. So for example, my aunt had a gall attack after she ate one of those things from Outback called an Awesome Blossom. And it's just because it's this it's super fried and fried and fried again onion. And um, so all of, again, the, the fat in that Awesome Blossom um, stimulated her body to secrete um, or to um, contract, especially the gallbladder will contract to push that bile into the small intestines. And um, unfortunately for her, when it did that, um, as the gallbladder contracted to push the bile in, the bile couldn't go anywhere because she had a gallstone that was blocking again um, the, the bile from uh, moving farther down into the bile duct. And so that caused considerable pain for her. Um, so again, it's that cholesterol inside the bile that actually oftentimes can cause some problems. Okay, so let's talk about um, the function of bile salts and we're, since we're primarily talking about digestive functions here. So bile salts are again um, responsible for emulsifying fats into smaller droplets. And um, they are important because this helps aid in the absorption of fatty acids, cholesterol, and certain vitamins with these bile salts. So basically what the bile salts are, bile salts are going to do here is um, they actually will break up a lipid into smaller lipid droplets. And they do this by actually surrounding the lipid drop it, droplets. So um, this makes lipids much um, more likely to be absorbed in the small intestines if we break up that lipid into its lipid droplets. Um, and so also along with this, um, bile salts will do the same thing with cholesterol and then also certain lipid soluble vitamins. Okay? So any lipid soluble vitamins, um, bile salts will help aid in the absorption of. Okay, now the gallbladder um, is again this nice green organ here, yellowish green organ. And remember that's because its main function is to store bile. Okay. So um, the gallbladder is going to be this kind of pear-shaped sac, and remember it's going to lie on the underside of the liver or the back side of the liver. Um, and so here is, oops, sorry about that. Here is a picture of um, the gallbladder and where it would sit here behind the liver. So um, and again, here is a, a, another picture of the gallbladder here. And remember that the gallbladder is going to dump its contents into the cystic duct. Now remember, the reason that the gallbladder actually stores bile is because what happens is the liver produces the bile, and the bile moves down these common hepatic ducts um, into the common bile duct. And then if the hepatopancreatic sphincter is closed, that bile um, will then back up up the common dial duct here into the cystic duct and then into the gallbladder and fill the gallbladder. And so that's how the gallbladder fills with bile. So um, now we can talk a little bit about the regulation of bile release. So bile doesn't normally enter the duodenum until the hormone, lo and behold, you see it again, here it is, cholecystokinin stimulates the gallbladder to contract. So 
cholecystokinin is also going to stimulate the gallbladder to contract. Now remember, cholecystokinin also stimulated uh, the pancreas to secrete pancreatic juices. So cholecystokinin also is going to stimulate the gallbladder to contract um, and push out ex that ex excess bile into the duodenum. Okay, so and this is again just a diagram showing you um, the this pathway here. Oops, sorry about that. Let me go forward one more here. So you can see again um, when acid chyme enters the duodenum, again just like before we talked about cells from the intestinal mucosa are going to secrete the hormone cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin will then travel through the bloodstream okay, um, and back up to where to basically through the bloodstream back to the gallbladder where it will stimulate um, the muscular layer of the gallbladder wall then to contract. So then as the gallbladder contracts it will push the bile down into the cystic duct and then into the common, dial du common bile duct and then um, into the duodenum through the hepatopancreatic sphincter. And that hepatopancreatic sphincter will relax um, again and allow that bile to enter the duodenum. So that just gives you a nice kind of regulatory pathway for the gallbladder. So this is kind of a nice slide because it sums up um, most of your major digestive enzymes. So remember that there's gastrin here um, is one of your first hormones that we talked about, and gastrin secreted in the stomach when proteins first arrive in the stomach, and it's going to stimulate gastric secretion. So it's stimulating stomach digestion by stimulating, that's my abbreviation for stimulating gastric secretion. Okay, and then we have secretin, and secretin is a hormone that's secreted in the duodenum um, when acid chyme first arrives in the duodenum, and it's going to stimulate um, basic pancreatic secretions as well as it's going to slow gastric activity. So again, it will slow the release of gastric enzymes in the stomach. And that makes sense, right? Because again, if food is moved into the small intestine then and it's left to the stomach, then we no longer need to continue to keep secreting digestive enzymes into the stomach because the food has left the stomach. And then cholecystokinin, CCK, is going to be secreted from the duodenum as well. And it's secreted again just like um, up here. It's secreted when food arrives, when that acid chyme arrive, arrives. And it's going to cause pancreatic enzymes and bile secretion. So again, it'll cause pancreas to secrete pancreatic juices and it will cause the gallbladder to contract, um, releasing bile. And interestingly enough, cholecystokinin um, is also one of the hormones that helps um, to contribute to satiety or our sense of fullness. Okay, so now um, we can get back to the business of talking about the elementary canal. So remember that the, the stomach um, is going to dump its contents into the small intestine. Of course, we talked about the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. So the lengthy small intestine is going to receive, again, secretions from the pancreas and the liver and the gallbladder, and it's going to continue to complete digestion of the nutrients in that acid chyme. And of course, it's going to do this with all of those lovely digestive enzymes that the pancreas and the liver are going to release. The other major function, and I mean major function of the small intestine here, is that it is also going to absorb the products of digestion. So the majority of your absorption of nutrients is going to take place in the small intestines. That's actually why the small intestines is so long. If you look, um, this here is all small intestine. You may say, well, why do we have so much small intestine? And the reason being is that that's where we're doing most of the absor absorption of our nutrients. So we need to have lots of surface area in the small intestine to do lots of absorption of those nutrients. 
So again, that's a big, major function, again, of the small intestine. And then, um, it, of course, is going to transport any of the remaining um, residues into the large intestine. So anything that's remaining that has not been absorbed in the small intestine, again, gets dumped into the large intestine. And that actually happens here. So here you can see is uh, a portion of the ileum that's dumping here into um, the cecum of the large intestine. And then here all of this is large intestine as well. Okay, so parts of the small intestine. Remember that the small intestine is broken down into three major parts. There's the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Okay, so again, the duodenum is the first portion of um, the small intestine, and the ileum is um, the very end of the small intestines. And the ileum is what's actually going to dump its contents into the cecum of the large intestines. Now the small intestine is actually suspended um, from the posterior abdominal wall, so from the back abdominal wall, by this double layered fold of peritoneum that we call mesentery. And this is important because that mesentery really helps to hold the small intestines in place. So let me show you a picture of this. Here is um, that, that mesentery, that double layer fold of, of peritoneum. So, and again, um, that, that mesentery is, is just, again, peritoneum. So remember we talked about peritoneum being that serous membrane that surrounds your digestive tract. So we just have this double membrane of that here that helps to hold the small intestine in place. So all of this yellow stuff here is mesentery. And this is cool because you can actually see it breaks it down into, again, um, the um, duodenum. So here's the stomach. Again, here would be the pyloric sphincter here. And here's the duodenum and then the jejunum. And then you'd have the ileum. And then um, that will dump into the cecum of the large intestine. So structure of um, the small, in the wall of the small intestine. The inner wall of the small intestine is going to be lined with these finger-like structures called villi. So again, the mucosa of um, the small intestine is going to look like this. It's going to have all these finger-like villi, okay? And the reason that it has these finger-like villi, if you remember from the beginning of this lecture, is that those finger-like villi are going to greatly increase the surface area available for absorption. So if you look at this here, now we can absorb nutrients all across here and here and here and here instead of just absorbing nutrients across the surface. So it basically, you know, doubles our surface area for um, and even, uh, and it, it actually more than doubles, I should say, it more than doubles our surface area for absorption across the small intestine by having these finger-like villi. Um, these finger-like villi will also help to aid in mixing action, but their, their main function, guys, is absorption. So the main function of having those finger-like villi is for extra absorption. If you look at each villi, each villi is going to contain um, a core of connective tissue that's going to house lots of blood capillaries, and that's, of course, for that function of absorption. We're going to absorb nutrients right across the villi into these blood capillaries, and it's also going to have a lymphatic capillary going up the middle of it, running up the middle of it, called a lacteal. And remember, we talked about lacteals um, when we talked about the lymphatic system. So the lacteals are actually going to help um, absorb lipid droplets. And if you remember, the lacteal is part of um, the lymphatic system. So eventually, um, these Lacteals will then dump their contents into, again, lymphatic vessels, which will eventually dump their contents into the subclavian vein and into the bloodstream where it can travel throughout the body um, and be dispersed into the, the tissues that need it. So again, that's how we're going to transport um, lipids. So one of the ways that we can transport some of the lipids um, into the bloodstream is through these lacteals. So let me show you these, what these lacteals look like. 
So here you can see is one of these finger-like villi that's going to line the small intestine. And here you can see the blood vessels, the blood capillaries that are running through here. So again, we can absorb um, nutrients um, directly across these villi into the blood capillaries. And then what's cool here is we have this lacteal, and this lacteal um, is specialized to absorb lipid droplets. So it'll absorb the lipid droplets into um, this lacteal, and that lacteal will then dump into the lymphatic system and eventually into the blood through the subclavian vein. So um, remember the reason we call these lacteals lacteals is that because they're carrying all of these oil or lipid droplets, um, they form this kind of milky substance, and so that's why it gets its name lacteal. Okay. So, secretions of the small intestine. So what's cool about the small intestine mm, is that not only does it have these finger-like villi, okay, that you see here, but then each of these cells here lining the villi um, actually have microvilli coming off of them. And so they have their own little finger-like structures, and these are the microvilli. And what's cool about these microvilli is, one, of course, they increase surface area, right, for absorption of, of nutrients across the mucosa lining. But also, these microvilli will actually um, release digestive enzymes. So they actually have embedded in them digestive enzymes um, that will break down proteins. So we have peptidases that will break down proteins. We have sucrase that will break down um, sucrose, which is a carbohydrate, maltase, which will break down maltose, another carbohydrate, lactase, which will break down lactose, another carbohydrate, and intestinal lipase, which of course is going to break down lipids. So, again, what's cool is that these microvilli, again, not only can absorb nutrients, but they also can help to break down some of these macromolecules into um, the nutrients that can be absorbed. So again, you know, the microvilli can here secrete peptidases that will break down proteins into their basic amino acids, and then it can absorb them across those microvilli. So again, it's really amazing in terms of how efficient, again, um, the body is. Here, we're secreting digestive enzymes to break down and digest some of these macromolecules so we can then just turn around and absorb them at the same place. Um, and this is just another picture showing you, again, the blood capillaries and then the lacteal that runs right through the center um, of that villi. So again, showing you that major function for absorption. All right, so regulation of small intestinal secretions. So mechanical and chemical stimulation from the acid chyme causes your goblet cells to secrete mucus. And obviously this is important because, again, uh, that protects the mucosal lining from the acid chyme that has just entered the intestines from the stomach. So again, um, secreting that mucus is very important. Also, um, that mucus helps to aid the movement and reduce friction of the movement of, again, that chyme as it moves through the intestines. Now, distension of the intestinal wall as the acid chyme moves into the intestines. So as that chyme moves into the intestines, it's going to push out on the intestinal walls. That's what we mean by distension of the intestinal walls. And that stretching or um, distension of the intestinal walls is what's going to stimulate the parasympathetic reflex. Um, and that parasympathetic reflex will stimulate secretions from the small intestine. So it'll stimulate, again, the microvilli to secrete things like peptidase and sucrase and, and maltase and so on. 
Now, absorption in the small intestine. The small intestine is going to be, again, and I have it in bold here, the major site of absorption for nutrients within the alimentary canal. So, again, it's the major site of absorption. Um, as you're going to see, the large intestines um, does not absorb nutrients in it. That's, again, the major role of the small intestine. So this is just showing you, again, um, where will the absorbed nutrients go. So again, um, many of your um, lipids that are broken down will be absorbed into the blood capillaries. Your um, amino acids that are, again, from the breakdown of proteins will be absorbed into your blood capillaries. Monosaccharides from breaking down carbohydrates are absorbed there um, in the blood capillaries. So again, um, they'll all of these nutrients can be absorbed in the blood capillaries. Um, and then from there... Um, they will actually move into the liver. And this is important because, again, remember the liver acts as a filter. So if we've just taken, again, um, food in and nutrients into the bloodstream from, again, you know, an outside source because food has come from outside of the body, um, then chances are we could be introducing pathogens. So uh, what we do is we go ahead and send that blood through the liver first so that way then the liver can filter out um, bacteria, many of the bacteria and foreign agents that would be um, in it, that could potentially have been introduced with our food. So, and then from the liver, um, the blood will move to the heart where the heart can then eventually pump out that blood carrying those nutrients um, throughout the body to the target tissues. So, um, that's where our nutrients go into the blood. Now, remember that we have this lacteal here, and this lacteal can also, again, absorb um, lipid droplets. And those lipid droplets will move through the lacteal um, into lymph vessels, and then eventually into um, a duct, and then eventually into the subclavian vein, where that now the lipid droplets will enter the bloodstream. So movements of the small intestine. The small intestine, as you, as we kind of talked about, is going to carry um, on two major movements that we talked about in the very beginning of this lecture, segmentation and peristaltic contractions. Segmentation um, is going to be important for mixing foods. So this is segmentation here. And again, segmentation is going to be um, the... Um, basically the alternation of contractions here, back and forth. Um, so that way then we get the mixing of our food in with the digestive enzymes. So that's one, again, um, muscular action that occurs in the small intestine. The other one that's going to occur is these peristaltic contractions or peristaltic waves. And remember that peristalsis is just a wave of contractions that will move um, down the alimentary canal, in this case down the small intestines, to move that chyme down the small intestine. So the purpose of peristalsis is to move chyme through the intestines. Now, at the end of the intestines, so again, as that chyme moves from the duodenum through the jejunum and into the ileum, at the end of the ileum, for that chyme to leave the small intestines and enter the large intestines, it has to move through the ileocecal sphincter. And again, remember that this sphincter, again, names um, the two places that it's connecting. It's connecting the ileum and it's connecting um, the cecum of the large intestine, okay? So that's why we call it the ileocecal sphincter. Again, this hopefully will help you so that you don't have to do so much memorization. Again, it makes sense that we would have a sphincter here to prevent the backflow of food from the large intestines into the ileum. So, again, we call it the ileocecal sphincter because it's, again, in between these two areas. Um, so, the ileocecal sphincter will remain closed unless a gastroileoreflex is elicited after a meal. And when that gastroileoreflex is initiated, what will happen is um, it will stimulate peristalsis 
and it will relax that ileocecal sphincter so that the peristaltic contractions will move the chyme through the small intestines and then through that ileocecal sphincter into the cecum. Okay, so now we can talk about the large intestine. So here you can see, here's the ileum, and this is where the ileum is going to dump into the large intestine. So again, here would be, right here would be the ileocecal sphincter, right here. And so again, as food moves through the ileocecal sphincter, it's going to first enter the large intestine in this place called the cecum. So right here is considered the cecum of the large intestine. And it's off of the cecum here that you're going to find the appendix. So then um, the cecum leads into what we call the ascending colon. Okay. Then the ascending colon will lead into the transverse colon here. And then the transverse colon will lead into the descending colon here. So all of this is the descending colon. And then the descending colon will then lead into the S-shaped sigmoid colon. So here's the S-shaped sigmoid colon. And then the sigmoid colon will eventually then dump its contents into the rectum. So again, um, that breaks down the large intestines for you into its basic parts. And the large intestine, um, the main function of the large intestine is going to be to absorb um, any excess water. So any water that wasn't absorbed in the small intestine, um, some of that excess water will be absorbed in the large intestines. It will also help to absorb some extra electrolytes. And, of course, then um, anything that's not absorbed will form the feces. And so, again, uh, the large intestine will help store the, the feces um, before they're released into the rectum. So, again, the large intestine does not, I repeat, does not digest or absorb nutrients. Um, it does, however, secrete mucus. So it does, again, continue to secrete mucus like the small intestines, but it does not, I repeat, not digest or absorb any nutrients. It only absorbs electrolytes and water. Now, the large intestine um, also contains some important bacteria that help to synthesize um, certain vitamins, as well as um, those bacteria will help to use or break down cellulose. Now what's interesting is these bacteria in the large intestine, when they're metabolized and breaking down um, some of these products like cellulose as a byproduct, they will produce gases. Um, and so those gases can build up in the intestines and eventually have to be released as a fart, if you want to call them that, <laughs> okay? And so when, um, when you're talking about, again, uh, the formation of a fart. I have to keep it interesting for you here, right? So here's more interesting information for you. Really, um, all it is, is it's waste products from bacterial metabolism. So that air is basically the, a waste product of the metabolism of the bacteria. All right. So um, that concludes our digestive lecture. And as you can see again from, um, from the large intestines, again, any um, byproducts that were left over um, would then be dumped from the um, large intestines here, especially the sigmoid um, portion, sigmoid colon portion of the large intestine, into the rectum. And then the rectum, again, would contract and push that material um, into the anal canal out through the anus. So, in short, okay, um, this just doesn't happen. <laughs> and now you can appreciate that after going through um, two and a half hours of lecture on the digestive system. So I thought you all would um, appreciate the humor in that now. Okay, no, I just posted these because they were kind of interesting because my previous classes um, had asked these questions, and um, so I wanted to include them for your information. So 
one of my classes asked, well, we talked a lot about vitamin B12. Why is vitamin B12 important? Um, so B12 is important because um, it has a key role in kind of the normal functioning of the brain and the nervous system. Um, and it's also important for the formation of blood. So again, vit vitamin B12 is a very important um, vitamin for us. And that's that's one of the main reasons why, um, if you remember, we talked about um, the release of intrinsic factor. So remember that the um, parietal cells will release intrinsic factor um, in the stomach. And remember that intrinsic factor will help vitamin B12 to be absorbed. So um, the reason that we release that intrin intrinsic factor to help vitamin B12 to be absorbed across the intestines is that, um, that vitamin B12 is important for all of these functions. So again, it's important for the brain, it's important for the nervous system, it's important for the formation of blood. Um, it's normally involved in the metabolism of every cell of the human body, especially affecting um, your DNA synthesis and regulation of DNA synthesis inside your cells. Um, so uh, again, it's just a very important vitamin for a number because it plays a number of different roles um, in the body. And if you're wondering um, where vitamin B12 can be found, vitamin B12 can be naturally found in foods that come from animals. So um, especially fish and shellfish, um, meat, especially liver, uh, poultry, eggs, and milk and milk products. So what this means is if you eat a vegan diet, it's very important for you to take in um, a vitamin B12 supplement. And um, you can get um, these vitamin B12 supplements now because we actually um, have bacteria produce vitamin B12 for us. So that is um, the skinny on vitamin B12. I also had a student ask um, one semester, how long does it take the stomach to empty after eating? And um, remember that this is going to vary um, greatly depending upon the meal that you've had. So after consuming a typical solid meal, there's usually a lag time of about 20 to 30 minutes in which um, there's very little gastric emptying happen, happening. So again, um, on average, again, you're, you're keeping um, food from a solid meal in your stomach um, at, for at least 20 to 30 minutes. Um, this is usually followed by a phase in which the rate of emptying then um, is linear, which means it just gradually increases over time. And so again, that's for a solid meal. Now, in contrast, liquids are generally transported out of the stomach um, very rapidly. So again, uh, liquids will empty the stomach much more rapidly than, than solids will. Um, and let's see, if the liquid also is low in nutrients, um, again, the, the rate at which it empties would be even faster as well. So this is kind of cool because this shows you um, the... Uh, rate of um, emptying okay, out of the stomach um, with a liquid meal versus a solid meal. So you can see again a liquid meal would um, leave the stomach much more rapidly than a solid meal would. All right, so I think that concludes our digestive lecture. Again, if you have any questions for me, um, then please feel free to uh, email me those questions or um, even better you could write the questions in on the discussion board I haven't been getting that many questions lately on the discussion board and again the discussion board is a nice way for you to share your questions with other students that might have the same question and that way then I can answer you all at once um, also my other hint for you with a digestive lecture is you may actually want to make um, a you know a sheet that draws out the pathway um, by which a food bolus would move through the alimentary canal. 
and um, again include all of the sphincters in this so you know you could go from the mouth into um, the pharynx into the um, esophagus through the upper esophageal sphincter and then the esophagus into the stomach um, through the gastroesophageal sphincter and then the stomach into the duodenum through the pyloric sphincter and so on so again um, that will help you greatly in your studying if you can kind of create Eight, uh, a flow diagram of how a food bolus would move through the alimentary canal. And then you can actually draw in all the accessory organs as well, like the pancreas and um, the gallbladder and the liver, and show um, where, again, those secretions will empty the duodenum through the hepatopancreatic sphincter and so on. So again, that's my suggestion for you in terms of um, doing at least a, a flow diagram to help kind of summarize some of this information for you. So I hope that helps you out a little bit. And again, um, feel free to email me with any questions.